Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the What Is Money show. I'm sitting down again today with the legend himself, Mr. Jason Lowry. Jason, welcome back. Hey, Robert. Thanks for having me back. Glad you're back, man. Um, Our conversation last time left my head spinning, so I'm looking forward to extending that. So I think as we were talking offline, maybe it's useful to begin by just summarizing a little bit of what we covered last time. Um, I think bringing us up to kind of the history of war, and then we'll, we'll go from there. Sure. Okay. So in our last conversation, we, we spent a lot of time talking about engineering, talking about evolution. So engineering is the art of figuring out what works. It's a very pragmatic discipline. We take the equations and stuff from the smart minds and we use our hands to make use of it. In evolution, it's pretty much the same story. Nature is constantly iterating. Nature is constantly trying to figure out what works and it either does work or it doesn't work. And if it works, you know it because it survives. And if it doesn't work, you don't see it because it doesn't survive. Mm. And in my hypothesis, in in my thesis, I think my goal is to just point out that if you observe nature, there's a very clear link between power projection and survival. Animals which project power in the most clever way tend to control the resources more. And I, you can also observe that property is only ours insofar as we can defend it as ours. So ownership, this concept of ownership itself from a first principles physics slash engineering lens is essentially, are you capable of projecting power of transferring tools over time to maintain your ownership of the thing? And animals constantly establish pecking order. They constantly have this power projection struggle over resources. This protocol is what we could call a permissionless protocol. Meaning when a lion needs resources, he doesn't go ask for permission from the zebra to go eat the zebra. Power projection is a permissionless control structure over resources. And when you watch like nature shows, it can, you know, there's the saying that nature is metal, right? Like nature is pretty heartless. They play this power projection game pretty brutally, but that is what nature is. And then recall that we talked about how Life itself is just the thing that is moving in the opposite direction of entropy. We're the, we're the thing that can swim upstream. So if we're going to succeed, then it is an existential necessity for life to figure out increasingly clever ways to project power, to scale our power projection, for the fittest power projectors to survive. And yeah, this world is going to be pretty unforgiving to those who sit around and don't play in this game. We, we actually, like life literally evolved to have limited lifespans to force itself to, to test more features in a production environment effectively, to mutate more often, more often, more often, more often, to constantly hedge against the tail risk of a changing environment to make sure that whatever happens, there will be some form of life somewhere that can come out on top of the new environment when it emerges. And we talked a lot about how that played out beautifully and how all mammals are the result of that entrepreneurial pursuit to basically hedge against the tail risk. So winners of the power projection game get to control the state and chain of custody of resources. And most importantly, and the thing that I think most people forget is that nobody gets to unsubscribe from this power projection game. 
Nobody gets to volunteer to not be eaten. This protocol is derived from physics and physics is blind to your morals. All physics sees is joules per second. So you don't get the option to not bleed if your heart gets pierced by a sword. You obey this power projection consensus protocol over the chain of custody of resources, whether you like to or not. Like you can think that you own that resource, but if your heart gets stabbed, guess what? It's going to be hard to continue to own that resource. So this is a 4 billion years old game. And as we talked about last episode, nobody plays this game better than humans do, homo sapiens specifically. Mm-hmm. We are predators, whether we like to admit it or not. I, my family owns pastures. We raise beef cattle. We're predators, whether you do the dirty business or not. The state, of, the state and chain of custody of resources that we enjoy today, our citizenship, the contracts that we buy, the contracts that are considered valid, all of that was written in blood. There is, there is no such thing as a country that exists that, you know, that's how all countries were formed. That's how they were forged. This is how property rights and laws um, emerged. It was through this. We fought for it. I would like to read a quote from you here to this very point. Uh, I think this is from your podcast with Jimmy. And you said, quote, the power of every bullet, the power of every bomb, the power of every engine behind every tank, every truck, every ship, every sub, every airplane, the power behind the heartbeat of every service member of every military that's ever served in the world is measured quite literally, in watts. Those watts are expended for the purpose of defending property, defending a rule of law, defending whatever needs to be defended. And yes, it is super inefficient to create a giant standing military that does nothing but sit there and defend your rule of law or whatever you want to say you own. But even more expensive than creating a standing military is being invaded or being conquered by another military. So that was a brilliant uh, and poetic way to sum it up. And I would just add here, even defending the rule of law, this came up in my conversation recently with Kinsella, the entire purpose of law, the bedrock of law is property, ultimately. It's to resolve disputes over scarce resources. So we've all, the common phrase we throw around is possession is nine tenths of the law, but you know, this, I mean, this guy is an attorney and a uh, very studied one at that. And he's like, well, actually it's all about property ultimately. So this whole game, right? This whole game we're doing as a species is ultimately resting on who has what rights to what resources. And a question I'd like to put to you is, as you've tied this all the way back to the, the, the dim Darwinian mist we crawl out of as single celled organisms. <laughs> is property then just an extension of territoriality? Is that all this is? I, I think so. I think that would be a way to put it. Your life, your liberty, and your property are all just resources. Are, are. Yeah, I, I, I think so. Traditionally, I think of territory as just like 3D space, Hmm. but it is the thing to be defended. And if you want to have permissionless control over your territory, your resource, whatever you want to call it, you have to be able to project power to countervail the control authority of someone else who might be impeding your access Mm -hmm. to the thing. So without power projection, without the ability to fight for your ownership of the thing, the opposite of that is you are getting permission from someone to have your life, liberty, your property, because they could take it from you at any time. Like you're basically just relying on, the more powerful person or relying on someone else to not take that from you. Right. So you're either projecting the power, outsourcing, 
the projection of power or you're just defenseless essentially. Or the, yeah, the third one defenseless is trust. You trust, oh, yeah, you trust, right. You defend it yourself and you outsource the power. Trust your hashtag NGMI. Mm-hmm. Maybe you can defend it yourself just depending on what you're defending against. Mm-hmm. Like you could probably effectively defend against me if I tried to take your stuff. And, <laughs> but the, the other one is you, yeah, you pay or you get someone else to defend you. And so this is actually a perfect segue into how civilization, at least what we see today, agrarian civilization emerged. Before that, one more question or wrinkle in here. So it's it's not only, as it seems to me, that you're establishing permissionless control or what I would also say is sovereignty over resources, just the authority to act as one sees fit. But like in the example you gave of the lion and the zebra, the zebra is a resource to the lion. It's food. But that zebra, I mean, the lion has to project force in a clever enough way to overcome the sovereignty of that zebra to make him a resource, right? So it's not only projecting power from um, usurpers, I guess, but it's also projecting power onto food sources. Yeah. And just consider that fight. Lions or like tigers, the lions too. They evolved strong muscles. They can run fast. They're on four legs. They can turn quick. They've got tails to help balance. They've got teeth, big teeth to help sink in so they can attach to a zebra. The zebra has all kinds of stripes designed to confuse the passive receptor of perceptors that the lion evolved, its, its eyeballs. And so these are all different strategies. This gets into the clever part. You have all these different tactics that you use to play this power projection game in a more clever way. Being powerful alone isn't enough to win the game. You have to be clever. And it is, most importantly, a probabilistic game. You're not guaranteed to win. Mm -hmm. So you compete together in a probabilistic game and then there is a winner and that winner controls the state and chain of custody of it basically writes the ledger of resources. In this case, whose meat belongs to you. It stops Mm -hmm. belonging to the zebra and it starts belonging to the lion because the lion successfully projected power Mm -hmm. and won the competition. The game though, I mean, it's, it's perpetual, right? These strategy, the strategy that is lion and the strategy that is zebra, they're, constantly in a dynamic tension between one another with, you know, natural selection, I guess, driving the adaptation. Um, It's just fascinating. It's a fascinating through line for me because you can come to look at every, like even the individual cell is kind of its own little strategy dealing with whatever, whatever microcosm of Darwinian environments going on inside your body then there's the actual organism that's a strategy engaging with other organisms. And we could also say organizations, like these things we put together are just strategies, right? We're just putting together a strategy, competing with other strategies. And they're um, constantly mutually shaping one another through their collisions and interactions. One of the you things- You see it I, at every level too. Yeah. One, I don't want to, I'm just going to spitball some things I've been thinking about here. I'm trying to write this piece- it's kind of like an open letter to Jordan Peterson to some extent, and it's about power, the nature of power. And I'm trying to delineate between physical power, which I think in my mind captures kinetic and electric, anything that creates movement, basically, versus political power. Now, I know political power sort of grounds out in physical power too, but it's, it's kind of subtly different, at least in the human domain. So I just wanted to throw that like, this thought experiment that I had is if you went back in time, if you took one well-trained guy back in time, 500 years with an Uzi and enough ammunition, it's like all of a sudden he's got the strategy in hand that is superior power projection. And using that strategy, he can establish very dominant political power in the world. So um, 
I don't know, not much of a question there, but there's a relationship between this physical power projection and political power establishment. Yes. And that political power wouldn't exist without a rule of law for that political power to exist, right? Like you op- you have political power because, because you're a group of people working together towards some ends. Yeah. And so the question is, maybe if we look at how that started, like specifically the first civilizations, how it started, why did we branch off and have laws? rules of law and how are they different than the militaries? And in fact, usually at least in the beginning, the militaries were the rule of law. Like they were Mm -hmm. the top dogs in that hierarchy. And to your point, this, when you view it like this, you see it exists at every layer. So like I constantly share on Twitter little videos of like single cellular organisms killing each other. Like last week I showed one of a single cell organism going up to another one and this like breaking its membrane open and all it's like single celled guts fly out. And it's just like, like a balloon, you know, that pops mm-hmm. just spins around pretty brutal. If it weren't for the fact that they're just single celled organisms, so they don't even know what's going on. What's crazy is even lower than that, this power projection strategy still exists. So a symbol molecules are assembling each other the road to the first successful single single cellular organisms was a lot of mangled proteins a lot of um, distorted or broken apart proteins structures so like if you look at microbiology it's it's a miracle what happens Mm -hmm. like how the how cells work and how these self-assembling proteins literally can walk around and have jobs like are like mechanical structures that have a job and they go back and forth. And it's just crazy how this stuff works. And it it's all the way down to that level, but it's all the way up to organization. And then it's beyond organizations, how multiple different organizations work holistically. Mm. And what I want to show is how that's pretty consistent at every layer and how Bitcoin is the same game in a different domain and one that will have enormous complex emergent properties that will benefit society. Great. So, so that so then it's do we go into the history of war from here to describe how it's been done? Yeah, I think so. I think since I think time memorial to do it. <laughs> yeah. So I think if we take the time to understand why civilizations have militaries then I think it can do a good job at helping people better understand why Bitcoin is so special. And then specifically why proof of work, that power projection game is so special. So to to say it differently, a lot of people spend time on the history of money. This is the what is money podcast. There's a lot of people in the finance world that look at Bitcoin from a finance lens. I could never do a better job explaining that than the people who've already charted that path. I think what I can offer is for people to understand it from a perspective of the history of militaries, of the history of warfare, because I think that's one of the hidden but most important value propositions of of Bitcoin. So if we we go back, recall we've, we've effectively slaughtered everything. The average size of mammals has decreased by 100x We've killed all of our near peer competitors. Only sapiens are left. We use cooperation and shared abstractions to to cooperate at scale, to transcend Dunbar's number. We've gotten to the agrarian area of about 10,000 years ago where we've started to, we figured out how to irrigate river watered land to grow food. We've domesticated something like 16 different types of animals via artificial selection. That's the nice way of saying it. It's genetic enslavement was the way I said it. Note how those domesticated animals were all herbivores. They weren't carnivores. We had to feed them. We had to feed them with the food that were growing off our rivers. Civilization was stuck in this river-based city-state world until that we we figured out how to harness the power of our animals that we had domesticated to plow 
land that was further inland, the stuff that was only watered by rain, not by rivers. So if you, a human with a plow can only dredge up so much soil to make it nutritious. But if you put a plow on the back of an ox, it's eight times more powerful than a human with a plow. So once again, another power projection, clever power projection strategy. Mm. Genetically enslaved, strong animals, put a plow on their back, have them dredge up the soil. We've irrigated land. You do this so much that you eventually get to the first agrarian surpluses where we have more food than we immediately need, which gives people the ability to develop specialized roles and division of labor so they can basically do stuff besides hunting and foraging all the time. And and then you start to introduce new complexities. You have to find ways to prevent crime, to resolve disputes, to create rules of law, to pass those laws. And so now we get up to the point where we have our first major city-states about 5,000, 5,500 years ago with dedicated division of labor. So you've got writers, you've got politicians or leaders, you've got judges, you've got some types of bureaucrats, you've got doctors, you've got priests, you've got artisans. I don't know if we had priests that far back. I think we still did. But then uh, what do you have also that's pretty important? Soldiers. So why do you have soldiers? Okay, so remember last episode, we talked about how many economic theories didn't last very long. A lot of economic theories tend to not survive as long as like physical, like physics equations. Well, here's a story. Here's an equation that keeps working. Here's an economic equation that keeps working. It only took about 200 years after these big city states emerged for the first economists to apply this theory at scale. And the theory goes like this. Here's an economic theory for you. If I put a million dollars in an open bed truck and drive it to the middle of Times Square and park it there and leave it, what's going to happen? It's going to get raided. (laughs) How long until somebody takes it, right? Do you even feel bad that someone would have their million dollars? Like, I don't feel bad. Like, if someone put a million dollars on the street and then walked away, I'd be like, why did you do something so dumb? How could you not expect that to be rated? Okay. So that, that there's a, what's the calculus that's going on in the, in people's brains when they see that million dollars, it's an economic equation. Okay. So let's go back 5,500 years. We're in the Eurasian continent sapiens are peak predators. We've dominated everything. And then a couple sapiens decide to park rich, fertile, irrigated land in the middle of this massive continent filled with starving peak predators. Like, what do you think is going to happen? (laughs) Right? Okay. So here's a lesson from some of history's most famous economists. And I'm going to refer to all military conquerors as economists, so we stop pretending like warfare is mutually exclusive to economics, like your economy is irrelevant if it can't survive. And it's it's like cringe for me to see economists act like there was ever a society that existed outside the reach of warfare. And so many economic theories take peace for granted or they assume peace exists for their equations to work. So from now on, I'm calling military conquerors economists. The lesson is the return on investment of capture, capturing your monetized territory increases if you don't put up a fight, if you don't put up any defense, right? That's why someone's going to take your million dollars mm-hmm. if you just leave it sitting there. If there's nothing stopping you, your return on investment is practically infinity. So if your civilization, whatever you've developed in your irrigated land, your city state doesn't have unity effort of effort, puts up less of a fight, then you're going to get an economist come at to your doorstep. Okay, so econ- econ- 
economies. Economics is trying to find math models which accurately describe reality. This one accurately describes reality. This has been consistent for 5,500 years. It's one of the few economic equations that keeps working. <laughs> the ROI of attacking you increases if you don't defend yourself. The more monetary property you create and the less you defend it, the higher the ROI for a third party to come and take it. In other words, agrarian societies, this act of irrig irrigation, the creation of city-states creates a giant honeypot security problem. Agriculture takes a lot of time and work to set up, and it produces a lot of value, and it's really easy to take if you don't defend it. So almost as soon as these city-states emerged 5,500 years ago, the first big economist pops up, Sargon, and he figures it out. He can go around and capture these city-states to create his empire, the world's first empire, because these people aren't defending their stuff. So why wouldn't you? And so this gets back to what we talked about earlier. If you have an agrarian society, if you have this big pot of money in the middle of a giant continent of peak predators, there's three ways to respond to the honeypot problem. The first one is trust your neighbor. Do nothing, accept the risk, and trust that your starving, resentful, greedy, and power-hungry neighbors are just going to let you continue to have your thing, right? Put your million dollars, park it in the middle of Times Square, and see how that works out for you. I would argue that's not something Bitcoin's value very much, Bitcoiners value very much, that trust-based strategy. So your second option is to defend it yourself. Okay, to resort back to the law of nature, remember property is only yours insofar as you can defend it as yours. But there's a problem with that. Can you guess what the problem is? There's a challenge with that. Um, I would assume it's very expensive to defend your property as yours and would also distract you from your other economic occupations. Exactly. So it's hard to defend your farm if you're too busy farming. <laughs> <laughs> like, ain't nobody got time to fight any wars. I got crops to grow. Yeah. Right? And then to your, your other point, it could be expensive, right? It's hard for you to defend your farm if your resentful, greedy, power-hungry, starving neighbor has 10,000 soldiers at the edge of your farm. So that's going to be, you're going to have a difficult time. Yeah. So what's the third option? Is you pay, we'll call them fees, to power projectors to defend you. So this is where we should have our first thought experiment. Is it voluntary to pay those fees to power projectors to defend you? You have three options. You can trust, you can defend, you can pay fees. What you don't have the option is you don't get to unsubscribe from the power projection protocol. Mm -hmm. You can't stop. You can't go and volunteer not to have your stuff taken. That's not how this works. All of these are reactions to our decisions that you have to make in response to a threat. So you are being coerced by the law of nature, the threat that exists out there. You've got a lot of mean neighbors out there. You can trust, you can defend yourself on your own. You can pay fees to power projectors to defend you. If you don't pay fees to people to defend you, you will find yourself defenseless unless you can do it yourself. And, and so I bring this up because we need to understand that with the development of militaries, with the development of warfares, there was a lot of points where new shelling points emerged. And the shelling point that emerged with these early city-states was that you pay fees to your power projectors, your kinetic power projectors in this case, your soldiers, to defend your property, to defend your economy. If you need that defense, you don't get the option to not need defense. You have to have it. If you need defense, but you don't pay for it, 
you'll still pay for it, but you won't have it. So in my, in my opinion, you could argue it either way. I could say, yeah, it is voluntary. If you don't want to pay your fees to your defenders to defend you, then defend yourself or trust your neighbor. Good luck. See how well that works out. Or I think, and you could also argue it is involuntary because like I said earlier, you're, you're coerced by the threat. So like, yeah. you know, if, if someone builds a, if someone, you, if you have a house and someone builds a train track that leads straight into your house and then puts a train on it, pointing at your house and then turns it on full steam headed straight at your house. Is it voluntary? Are you leaving your house because it's voluntary or are you leaving your house because there's a threat, the imminent threat that you have to respond to? Like, I don't think there's anyone in the world who would, who would want to pay (laughs) fees to power projectors if it were strictly voluntary, if it were strictly optional. Yeah, well, like this is a great, it's a nuanced argument too. And I think the first point I will agree with that for property in the sense that we understand it to have integrity, it has to be defended. (laughs) That's the nature of what property and the rule of law is doing, by the way, just like we said in episode one, you don't want to fight to the death of every sandwich. So we develop these protocols, frankly, for resolving disputes over scarce resources in more economic ways, right? It's more economic and peaceful and less risky for us to go to court or to an arbiter of some kind and resolve a dispute versus fighting to the death of every sandwich. Makes a lot of sense. Um, the voluntary versus, so it's in a sense, it's like, okay, agreed. It's not, it's, it is voluntary to project force or not, but you're dumb not to like, you have to defend to have property. I agree with that. The issue comes into play when you have, at least in the Austrian literature, where it presumes the existence of a government already. So you've already communized really this defense service, right? We all pay a fee to a service provider that defends the borders within which we have certain protocols like rule of law, money, property, etc. cetera. Um, I think the argument here gets a little more murky because the real issue becomes when those per- force projectors or defenders whose purpose is to preserve property rights, right? To protect this economic enclave, to leave it peaceful, to, to adhere to these protocols that people, you know, presumably signed up for. You kind of don't really, you're just kind of born into it. But the problem really comes when they then turn that power back on the citizens, right? When you start to violate the rule of law, for instance, to enrich whoever can do it at the expense of who can't do it. That's where the, and that's where like taxation itself, the income tax, you could say that's unconstitutional. Many people have argued that it's unconstitutional. Inflation is a very pernicious one. Or, you know, you've just got this legal monopoly wall. There's an in-group and an out-group. An in-group can benefit from inflation. They can do it, you know, more or less arbitrarily, right? There's certain criteria that we, we don't exactly know what they are. Um, to reach that decision. And then the the cost of that decision are then externalized onto those that cannot inflate the currency, for instance. So I think that is the crux of the Austrian, like at least the ethical side of it is that it's when the violation of these protocols, the cost of the violation of the protocols externalized onto people. It's not really voluntary. It's not like they decided, oh, whatever happened, Fed, go print $10 trillion and I'll pick up the bill. Don't worry about it. Like it, it's a, it is murky again because then people argue, well, no, you have elected officials that appoint the Fed chair, um, which I'm not even sure yeah. if that's the case. So you implicitly you could, agreed to it. Right. Or, you know, there's nothing that says you have to continue the Federal Reserve Act. You can vote to overturn it. 
Yeah. So here's the deal here. And I read Mises on this and it's like, okay, citizenship would indeed be voluntary if you could refuse to pay the fees, right? If you decide the level of service I'm receiving from the property defender is inadequate from what I am paying, if it's optional, then I have the option to say no. So then I could leave the territory or the country and I could go find another service provider. Now this is somewhat true in the US at least, unless you're above a certain threshold of net worth or income, you can't even do that without paying an exit tax. So the equivalent of that is I roll into your house, I put a gun to your head, I say, hey, pay me to protect your property and I'll protect your property. And if you don't want to pay me to protect your property, then pay me to leave. <laughs> yeah. So Gangster that's where strategy. the involuntarism of this whole taxation phenomenon comes into play. And I agree with that. Like I'm not disagreeing with the necessity of force projection and property defense, but I do disagree that the, the social contract gets violated, right? What people signed up for. And it's, again, it's murky because to what, what did people sign up for? Like I didn't, did you, I didn't sign a social contract of any kind. I was just born into the U S and that I live here. Um, and the second part is like, to what degree do people even understand this? Like the things we're talking about right now, they're very essential, but most people don't think about this. They just kind of take their socioeconomic reality at face value. Yeah. Hey everybody. As you've no doubt learned by watching this show, Bitcoin is the single most important asset you can own in the 21st century. And one of the most important companies in Bitcoin today is Nidig. Nidig's mission is to get Bitcoin into the hands of as many people as possible. One of the ways they are accomplishing this mission is by empowering banks and financial technology companies to offer their own Bitcoin products and services. As a true game changer in the industry, Nidig is safely unlocking the power of Bitcoin for forward-thinking individuals and institutions alike. Led by Robbie Gutman, Yin Zhao, and Ross Stevens, Nidig has absolutely exploded onto the Bitcoin scene recently and has quickly become a leader in this space. So whether you are a professional investor looking for asset management services or a company looking to white label your own Bitcoin product or service, consider Nidig your single source solution for everything Bitcoin. So if we unpack this, we've established that a, a first principles look at how agrarian society emerged and, and how this power projection game plays into it. People agree to a common set of rules they pool their resources together to pay power projectors to defend them. Defenders take that money. They build a defense industrial complex where they specialize in projecting power in increasingly clever ways in order to make it too expensive for external people to attack the group that you're in. We should add, they're usually also conquering others too, to your original point. If it's economic to take over some territory, that's what you're going to do. Yeah. If there's people who are fool, foolish enough to put a million dollars in the middle of Times Square and out defend it, and you've already gone through the trouble of building this giant military, <laughs> might as well take that one too. That's mm -hmm. these, ec these economists have emerged over time. They go by different names. They go Sargon, Charlemagne, Hannibal, Napoleon, the British Empire. Genghis Khan. Genghis Khan's my favorite. I think yeah. he's one of your favorites too. Yeah. So... Yeah, but to your point, now you, the security flaw now becomes, okay, well, how do you, you, you now have only, you still have to trust your power projectors is the problem, essentially. Mm -hmm. Like you've opted out of the trust your neighbor in favor of paying fees to power projectors to defend you, mm -hmm. but you're implicitly trusting your power projectors not to turn on you now. So that's a security flaw, that trust is a security flaw as has been illustrated for 5,300 years. 
the way around that. So I would call that, you know, you're in an, in an oppressive state. There is a way to get out of that. The, like the, the way to get out of that is not you exit or you, you stop like paying taxes. The way you get out of that is pony up and build your own military and countervail the control authority of the people who are oppressing you. So at least from what I can observe over history, that's kind of what ends up happening. Mm-hmm. So America, we stand up to sing a pledge, put our hands over our hearts and sing a song of a war that was fought to countervail the control authority over someone who's being oppressive with their power projection capability, someone who mm-hmm. is turning against us. So like exiting the British monarchy wasn't, I decide to stop paying my taxes and I go do my own thing. Exiting the British monarchy is I kill a bunch of redcoats until King George leaves me alone. Mm-hmm. So I think that's the important thing to make because like, if you don't want to be part of this agrarian civilization, then like the true exit is you go find some piece of unconquered land, which I don't think even exists anymore. You go grow your own food. You defend yourself, right? They, they act like the opposite of paying for your military, or I guess in your point, you could go subscribe to another military. That's, that's fair. Yeah. You could exit to another jurisdiction, which uh, is what we will talk about is I believe effectively what we're doing with Bitcoin. Yep. Yeah. By the way, because I love talking about this with, because, you know, a lot of people will say like the Mises thing, they'll, they will argue for a non-government militia, right? Mm-hmm. Like, why does the government have to have a monopoly on this power projection thing? Okay. So let's pull that apart. So my, my, my argument is always, if you think private militias are competitive against state militias, prove it. That's the point of one. militias. Yeah. <laughs> yes, go, go start one and defeat the state military. Right? And then, you know, the response is inevitably, well, <laughs> private militias would be sufficient at defending our property rights if it weren't for the fact that they're demonstrably insufficient at defending ourselves against state militias. Like, They'll say, oh, we can't build one. It's like, why can't you build one? You mean because the state military is more powerful than you? It's like, so, and then if you pull that thread even further, it's like, okay, what happens if you succeed? Let's just say you start your own non government military and you succeed, right? What do you call a non government military that wins? Government military. It's another government. (laughs) (laughs) You just created a, right? Okay. Okay. So say you don't want to accept that, right? It's like, okay, you create a non-government militia. You somehow through some miracle project enough power to fend off attack from the state or government militia. You win. Now what? Like you've, you've, you've forged your own corner of the world where you can't be bothered where your rule of law is the prevalent rule of law, but that's something worth noting, by the way, because we talked earlier about how there's different rules of law, which one's the legitimate one. Mm. How do you establish the legitimate rule of law? Easy. Or, yeah. Whoever's projecting the force. That's why the war is fought. Mm-hmm. Okay. So you've, you've created a non-government militia. You have your own corner of the world. Okay. How are you going to pay your militia? How are you going to keep them fed? How are you going to keep paying them? The the argument I think is, well, we know that we need to defend ourselves. So we'll let the free market, we'll contribute like basically tithing to our military to continue Mm -hmm. to defend us. Right. That's the private militia. Okay. All right, cool. What happens after a hundred years, 200 years, right. Of success, the first generation dies the people who actually fought in the war dies a new generation emerges that new generation has never experienced 
being invaded or being conquered. They, and here's something that commonly comes up for like anti-military things is they don't see any threat. So like the, tr the trouble with a militia is if you're successful, like if you have a good militia, you're not going to see a threat. No one's going to try to attack you. So you'll become so, a bad militia by atrophy. So, well, you basically become, people start to think that you're just a pure waste. Why am mm -hmm. I projecting all this power training constantly for a military that won't fight or do anything? Mm -hmm. Why am I doing this? We haven't been invaded. Like you forget why you need this. You don't see any threat. Okay. So these third generation private militia people are going to start pulling back the amount of fees that they're paying to their military. And then you do that enough the you get the economists back. Right. <laughs> right. And so like Genghis Khan is going to show right up to your doorstep and he's going to be like, what's up? Right. Like this is history over and over and over and over again. This repeats nonstop. Yeah. By the way, militias began private. They began as, of course. right? And then they became empires. Then they became massive government. Why? Because that's what wins wars. That's how you project power more right. effectively. Well, the very concept of taxation is what allows the public sphere to exist at all, right? There's no concept of public property without taxation. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Because who's defending it? And then if, again, if it's being paid communally, that is public property. I've got, a, I have a lot of issues with public property in general, but I get the genesis. I understand this. My current thinking, which I'm hoping to explore and challenge here is that this is like an evolution, a necessary evolutionary phase of society. But I do think, I think you labeled it earlier, like the oppressive state. I think we can evolve to a non-oppressive or less oppressive state model, largely through Bitcoin. So okay. the here, and I also agree with you here that, so the original example you gave of the fertile crescent of cultivated land, right? Surrounded by resentful, hungry neighbors. Clearly that draws a lot of attention that draws people towards you. It's a, it's a gravitational force economically. Uh, energetically, right? People are trying to eat. They want the food. And in that economic flow, like you have to build a dam effectively, right? You have to build walls. You have to build a resistance to it. And then in that world, this is why I always come back to the book where I know you said you haven't read it yet, but the sovereign individual goes into the economics of violence and how that's the reason society is always shaped by the prevailing technological realities. Because like, how do we project force how cleverly, and then also how do we defend from projection of force? Mm -hmm. Those two technological, that kind of cat and mouse game is what shapes civilization. So the trick is, and I'll just throw this out there, but I think it's good to build on with Bitcoin later. We want to build the most clever society by incentivizing cooperation, which is the cultivation of wealth and you know secured by property and all of these things. But that disincentivizes betrayal. This mm -hmm. is both between economic actors within the same enclave and betrayal by the defenders against the citizens. In other words, you need to make property very Trustless. cheap to cultivate and very expensive to violate. Something yeah. like that. So betrayal is a term that implies you trusted that person first. Mm -hmm. So if you'd never trusted the person, it's not a betrayal. If you never relied on that person to defend your property for you, you never were reliant. But yeah, so let's pull that thread. Okay, so, but, you know, by the way, this whole thing that we're talking about, like all this, this new structure that we're creating with laws and tax structures and violence, that is like the last 5% of sapien lifespan. Like we just recently started having enough time on our hands where we don't have to roam the world hunting and killing stuff where we can actually like start exploring these concepts. So this is a new thing. Another important thing to point out is 
these this strategy where organizations pull resources to pay their power projectors to defend their monetized property. This emerged in different places independently. So like last episode, we talked about how multiple different paths figured out teeth and camouflage, right? Multiple different societies figured out this defense structure and it happened pretty quickly in each of these initial places. So like The Mesopotamians figured it out, the Egyptians figured this out, the Indians figured this out, and the Chinese figured this out separately. They developed their militaries, they developed their empires. And the other thing that's important to bring up, which I'll just keep repeating until you're just sick of hearing it, is that this is the same power projection game that exists in nature at another scale now. We've now scaled it up one step further beyond city-states, now to empires, and now empires are going against each other, right? So like to your point earlier, you notice how it constantly scales? Mm -hmm. It's the same wall of nature. Property is only yours insofar as you can defend it as yours. It doesn't matter if it's a a wolf peeing on a bunch of trees or Sargon the Conqueror raising armies. Those who project power in increasingly clever ways win the right to set the state chain of custody of property. If it works, it survives. And that's what we see. Not all societies figured this out in time. So, for example, you're from Tennessee, right? I'm from Georgia. Okay. I was born in Georgia, actually, but I am from Tennessee. But I am from Tennessee. You're right. So do, do either of us look Cherokee? Right? Like, we look pretty European, Okay. How many people in Florida look like they're Seminole? How many people from California look like they're Chumash? How many people from Arizona look like they're Navajo? Okay. How many people from Egypt look Egyptian? How many people from India look Indian? Egyptians and Indians figure this out. China figure this out. How many people from China look Chinese? So again, if it works, if you know what works is what survives. You don't get to unsubscribe from this protocol. It's a, uh, you know, if you don't want to do it, you have to defend yourself. And the people who don't raise governments, they're not really around anymore. Not not a lot. Right. Okay. So what is war? I would argue it's the same power projection game that has been played for 4 billion years. It's the way that life figures out how to set a pecking order over resources. And as much as it's hard to admit, there are some unexpected positive emergent properties of warfare. There's a whole book about it. So What are those positive things? You've got permissionlessness, like we talked about before. You don't have to trust anybody if you can fight them away. Like the lion isn't asking for permission or from the zebra to eat it. That trust is still local to your local military, but like me and you don't have to worry about, like we're not asking permission from China to do stuff. We're not asking permission from Iran and North Korea to do stuff. The the established border, within the established border, the political apparatus affords us, hopefully, some of that permissionlessness that they earned through combat. Yeah. So you we walk around, you come visit me at Cambridge, I'll show you the graves of the people who died in the Revolutionary War at the Battle of Boston. Hmm. These people achieved permissionlessness locally for the Continentals right? The colonies permissionless from King George, but we still have, we still have local permission requirements, right? Like we, and people can abuse that. Okay. Um, If you have like a Sargon that goes capturing city to city, there's a lot less petty conflicts, right? They're now kind of aligned towards one goal. Okay. So you actually are able to scale more if you have better power projection, you can trade 
far across land farther. Mm -hmm. Like there is a, you know, look how effective Genghis Khan's economy was after he just like wrecked, uh, you know, how much he conquered. Right. And, uh, you know, more labor to irrigate land, more people working together. Some of them are slaves. Broader scope of trade, more roundabout production. Yeah. You get rich. And, and then another one, which is going to become important when we talk about Bitcoin, is people want to own property with the best defense. Of course. Like, look at the correlation to the world reserve currency and the dominant military. They, they tend to be the same thing, same yeah. country. That's not a coincidence. Would you rather own a ranch in the United States or would you, would you rather own some property in Hong Kong or Taiwan or Afghanistan? Right. Okay. So you, you want to own the thing with the best property defense, right? That's part of ownership. You only can own it insofar as you can defend it. You want the best defended territory. That's right. It's like, like in a better. in a gunfight, nobody wants the second best bulletproof vest, something like that. Yeah, exactly. Like yeah. people are willing to invest in that thing. Like you mentioned earlier, it attracts more people to that thing. Like which is interestingly yeah. called the power law, right? Oh, is it? Physics. Okay. Well, and yeah, just like uh like we could say money almost has a power law that whatever asset becomes most marketable. Gotcha, yeah people start wanting more of it just because other people want it. And you see this a lot too in the military where you talk about like, is there really such thing as like a second best air force? Like, you know, it's there a lot of times in military, it's like, it's like the theory of Ricky Bobby. If you ain't first, you're last. So you want to own the thing that's the strongest. You want your property to be in the place where it's the most defended it's in everyone's best interest for that. And so they'll tend to coagulate their resources and monetize the property that exists within the civilization that has the best defense. Okay. And then back to, you know, because this is your podcast, the big picture macro, what is life? Life is fighting against entropy. Okay. The more we can project power, the more we're able to power, fight against entropy itself. There's no, it's no surprise that the amount of cooperation that humans, human beings do together scaled along the civil, civilizations that fought the most, that engaged in the most war. We fight a thing, we build a temple. We fight, we build a temple. We fight, we build a temple. It goes from pyramids all the way up to the International Space Station. Right. That's the temple we built after we won the Cold War with USSR. Mm. So we scale cooperation much, much bigger because it is a, an existential necessity. Cooperation is a power projection strategy. If people are going to war with each other, you're going to need to project more power. You're going to need to cooperate more. You figured out how to cooperate more. Okay. So shelling points in military. Wait, if, sorry, let me ask one, let's insert one thing here. And this is, I guess I'd just like to hear your thoughts on the cost associated with these things. Like, so it seems to me that when the cost of defense, we could say is high, there's a greater incentive to do this as a communal effort, right? Because not anyone can pay for the army by themselves. So they need everyone to chip in a little bit. But as the cost of defense declines, more market actors are able to fund their own defense or in smaller pools. So I just wanted to insert that because that is core to the sovereign individual thesis is that as the cost of defense declines, sovereignties tend to fragment, which I think is really important for understanding Bitcoin whenever we get to that. We... People forget that like the point of a military isn't to make a profit. Like people will talk like it's so inefficient and so costly to build this military. And it's like, yeah, that's the point. That's the entire point is proof of work. Because, 
Yeah, it's the proof of work, right? It, it is super inefficient to sail carrier battle groups. You, know, you quoted me early, earlier to, to, to build these massive defense infrastructures, but you have to because economics, that first economic equation, if you don't do that, like if your economy is scaling in monetary value a lot and you don't increase your military, you don't continue to make it more expensive for someone to attack you by continually building a bigger military, then the most efficient thing that can happen is you lose your economy because Genghis Khan takes it from you. Like, yeah, it's inefficient to build all this stuff. That's the point. Yeah, it's expensive to build all this stuff. That's the point. We're dissuading other people from building a giant Navy, Air Force, Army, right? You want it to be expensive. That's how you prevent Genghis Khan from showing up. And so, but when we get to Bitcoin, as you'll, this, this is what's frustrating because Bitcoiners will get angry at people for saying that like the energy is wasteful. Like we're spending all this energy and it's not doing anything. And it's like, yeah, that's the point. <laughs> Bitcoin is a defense system. You want, it doesn't use enough energy. I want to just be dumping energy. That's proof. And the fact that no one is attacking it is proof that that energy was not wasted. Exactly. Right? The fact that we haven't been invaded is proof that our military is working. And security is really tough because there is no way you can say what the line is between enough spending and not enough spending. The only way you can discover on what side of that line you're on is the hard way. Right. <laughs> right. So, so, so no one can claim we are spending too much or not enough. I, unless you can claim you're spending not enough if China's showing up in uh, wherever you're living and taking your house from you. Okay, we probably didn't spend enough. So, um, yeah, that's just something to point out. Like, this is the core of understanding why militaries exist. It's the same power projection game that existed for 4 billion years. Humans are just kind of refining it. It's not perfect. Yeah, the tax structures are different. I'm the first that gets pissed off when someone some politician claims ostensibly that they're passing this thing for defense, but that money doesn't go to defense or that money's wasted. Mm -hmm. And I really don't like it when people, when taxes are coupled. So like the same tax bill is full of pork and there's mm -hmm. some defense stuff, but then there's this also other crap. I hate it. I'm the mm -hmm. first person to admit it, but when it comes to defense, just strictly defense, the fees that you're paying for strictly defense, there is, some merit to that like it works it the people that didn't do that aren't around anymore mm -hmm. right so we ha we just have to respect that and now that we understand why that game's played then we just look at those increasingly clever ways that power is projected over time some every you know technology is non-biological evolution we create new technologies that enable more clever, more effective power projection. Once those emerge, that becomes a shelling point. Everyone has to do it. So once people started paying taxes, you got to pay, you have to have a tax structure. When people started inflating their currency to pay for defense, you got to inflate your currency too. If they're, to, if you're to fighting. compete at the military level, you're saying that's yeah. a good point. Yeah. If, these are shelling points. So there, that's a, that's a financial shelling point. To in, in order to compete in war. There's also technological shelling points. So we went from speed, like once spears were invented, the shelling point is you got to have a spear if you mm -hmm. want to beat another guy with a spear. Once bow and arrows were invented, that's the shelling point. Once the missiles, the slingshots were invented, you know, throwing rocks really fast, that's the shelling point. Once ballistas are invented, that's the shelling point. Once ca catapults, trebuchets, those are the shelling points. I, I said this in, I think, one of our uh, spaces. Orban the engineer shows up to Emperor Constantine in Constantinople and offers to 
forge a giant iron cast cylinder, fill one in with gunpowder, fill the other end with a stone to build what he's calling an explosion engine. And Constantine turns him down, says, I don't got the money for that. It's not an option. Not really. Like, you better find it because if you don't, you're dead. And that's exactly what happened. Orban walked over to Mamed, a, a, a millennial, like a 19 year old kid with this new technology, and handed him cannons. And a year later, they're blowing down the walls of Constantinople, and Emperor Constantine is dead. In his speech, I actually read his final speech to his sol- soldiers. He's telling them, like, don't be, don't be afraid. Your swords, your shields are fully sufficient and will protect you in battle. He, he's referring to the, he's wow. like trying to calm them down because of what he refers to as explosion engines in his speech. Him and all of his officers are out there watching like 60 something cannons just ringing out nonstop. Orban was shooting nonstop for like six weeks straight huge cannon it took, took 60 ox to just haul it up to the wall wow they're freaking terrified he's telling them calm down don't worry we got this <laughs> our technology's fine right it wasn't fully sufficient so the shelling point is the new technology cannons became kind of a big deal we still use them we mm-hmm. still use guns we still right like the uh warships became a big deal muskets so smaller cannons rifles Machine guns, that became the shelling point as soon as they were invented. Airplanes became the shelling point as soon as they were invented. There's plenty of people discrediting airplanes thinking that they weren't going to be a big deal. They're the, the, the guy in charge of World War I, Foch, he said, quote, airplanes are interesting toys, but they're of no military value whatsoever. So let's just keep that in mind when we talk about Bitcoin later. ICBMs. Rockets. These were military technologies. We were snatching these scientists up from Germany like crazy because we knew we recognized if we want to continue to be on the winning side of power projection game, we need to hire these people. We need to develop these more clever ways. Then nukes happened and everything changes at that point. Mm -hmm. But so those are technology shelling points. We talked about financial shelling points, taxation printing money, debasement to pay for your military. There's also tactical tactics themselves change. Mm -hmm. One of the most frustrating things that modern day military officers like myself run into is, especially on Twitter, is this like people saying that like, people keep on talking like war is like an offensive and defensive thing. Like offense is bad, defense is good automatically. What they don't realize is offense, defense, and the associated attrition warfare stopped in 1800s because Napoleon won 88% of every fight of, out of 60 fights. He won 88% by changing the tactics from offense, defense to what we now call act, react, or maneuver warfare. Mm. So there's like uh, that awesome uh that his name's Cody. He, he made that thread about like how maneuver warfare works. He's quoting, oh, um, yeah. yeah, he's quoting the Marine Corps doctrine, like their first, you know, doctrine number one. But that is effectively a um, that document is basically taking Clausewitz on war and you know modernizing it, like what Clausewitz learned. Clausewitz had a lot of time to think about how warfare works now because he was a, as a prisoner of war to Napoleon. Mm -hmm. He got his ass kicked along with all the other Prussians and what is now Germany. They got their butts kicked in this offense defense way of thinking about warfare. It was like conclusive, like this is not how you win wars anymore. So people who are saying like the only right way to fight a war is defensive only. Mm -hmm. It's like, Okay, you just went back 200 years in it. like you know it's it it this argument breaks down for multiple reasons. First of all, argument number one why defense only is like a thing or like why it bothers me when people say defense is an effective war fighting tactic. 
let's say you you're back home in Tennessee or Georgia, you're sleeping happily in your home with your parents. A guy walks into your house, uh, armed, like hostile. Is it moral or ethical to fight him off? To project power to defend your house? Of course. I would, yeah, maybe. Okay. That guy is a Cherokee, <laughs> right? He, this is his land. This is his family's land for many, many more generations than you. You are part of the people who came and took it from him. Is it moral, ethical to fight him off? Right? So the problem is when people say defense is moral and ethical, you have to ask the question, how did you come to own the territory that you're defending? Right. Who homesteaded it originally? This is yeah. a very, I would just, Mention Rothbard's work on this because okay. he, he he distills everything down into property. And I'm not, it is arbitrary to some extent, um, but he makes the argument essentially if you're not making a productive use of the asset, then you, you lose possession of it at some point. Um, again, just drawing back to these protocols for dispute resolution, but your point's well taken. Second problem with defense argument, this is one that pops up in the Space Force all the time. I'm a Space Force officer. Got to protect and defend assets on orbit, in, to, from orbit. Okay. Who owns low Earth orbit? Whose property is that? Whose territory is that? Whose territory is geosynchronous orbit? Okay. China puts a weapon in orbit around the moon. Is that offense or defense? United States launches a counter to that, blows up their weapon in orbit around the moon. Is that offense or defense? It's totally an arbitrary, pointless, mm. even distinction to make. And by the way, physics is totally blind to it. All physics sees is power projection, mm -hmm. joules per second. Okay, problem with offense, defense, number three. Actually, I already said it. The problem is, if you think like that, you're going to take your morals to their grave because mm. Napoleon's going to kick your ass. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> like, right. like if, if you want to focus on like Nap Napoleon, here's how he revolutionized warfare. He said, I want you to focus on defense. Like that is beneficial to me because you're going to create your defense and I can just, now I know where all your stuff is and I can just go around it and then find another place to provoke you and measure your response. And then I'll fight you where I discover that your response is weak and I know where I can win, mm. right? Like I need to see your cards. So I'm going to find a way to provoke you. So you show me your cards and then I'm going to feign defeat and build the counter. And then I'm going to kill you later. And the, and hopefully you think you won in that first fight. So like, this is, um, this is just how things work now. It's act, react. It's not offense, defense. I, I'm like a huge Napoleon fanboy. You can read like the Battle <laughs> of Ohm, you know, like the Prussians thought they were anticipating that he was going to use a main road. And so they built a giant defensive fortified position on this road. Ended up being one of the largest ever surrenders. It was like 60,000 people. It was just something stupid. Because he went around. <laughs> Because he just surrounded them. <laughs> and, and, and the, the worst part is what, what's so hilarious is because, you know, like Napoleon was basically, uh, it was French people basically fighting a bunch of German people, what would become Germany. Uh, they forgot their own lesson. What happens in the 1940s? Okay. You go into France, decided to build a defense only strategy, hires Maginot, builds a big wall. How'd that work out? Mm. Right. <laughs> right. Like, so we need to stop this idea that offense defense is a thing because it's not a thing. Like, like castles don't exist anymore for a reason. Every defensive weapon system today looks exactly like an offensive weapon system. They're basically the same. Maneuver warfare is it. Act, react, preemptive strikes. These are like you can't do. There is no such thing as all offense defense in territory that doesn't right. belong to anyone. Well, to get it's the it's shaped. I mean, I guess we could say again using our through line earlier. 
these strategies or shelling points are sculpted really from the frictions of their collisions in warfare. Yeah. Um, also in the market too, we get to say, you know, as people are trading and competing, there's ideas emerging there, but there's a lot of technological advancement, rapid technological advancement in warfare. And it's interesting to me that, that sh- like you said, there's no more castles. It's like, well, there's no more castles because we learned how to project force in a way that can just demolish a castle in one shot or just fly over them <laughs> or fly over them on bomb. But, you know, yeah. Like any of these things. So again, it's, it, this is where my thinking on, I'm so glad you're talking about this because it's like you're thinking on human action just grounds out here. It's like, you're calling these guys, the great conquerors, economists. It's kind of a good moniker because it's all about the economics of violence or force projection in a more purely physics sense. And, it, and it's hard to describe them without sounding like a psychopath because I'm trying to take morals completely out of it, take a first principles look. And I I've noticed like a freaking psychopath. I've noticed that, that, and I found this in myself as well when I started reading because the economics of violence sounds like something a psychopath would read. And I'm yeah. reading this <laughs> in the sovereign individual and the, your initial feeling is not a good one. You're not like, Oh, this is a nice read, but you're drawn in because like who I've never heard of this term. Yeah. But I've noticed this in a lot of other people, the same thing, the feeling that I had myself was that it's uh it's jarring a bit. And if you talk about this on a podcast or in any polite conversation it can be drawing for others as well. This isn't a topic that makes you popular at parties. Right. Exactly. <laughs> this isn't a topic that uh, makes you popular on Twitter either, I've learned. Oh, you only have to Bitcoin be, Twitter. Yeah. You have to be careful which words you use. Yeah. Because pe- there's a lot of nuance here that's important to understand. And the, the tragedy here is like so many people are so quick to label like, all forms of government, all laws, all military as just pure evil without taking the time to fully understand why these systemic architectures exist in the first place, how agrarian societies emerge, how they work, what are the shelling points, how did we get here? Because if you take make a sincere effort to understand that and hopefully use the maybe use the power projection hypothesis that I've that I'm trying to push in my thesis, the framework for understanding it, then, then you can, we can finally start talking after like three hours about Bitcoin, mm-hmm. right? Like now we can actually finally talk, talk about Bitcoin. So, and, and appreciate it. Yes. Remember, remember like what works is what survives. It's very important to take what exists now seriously and study it because it worked. Right. 